Hi, friends. Welcome back to A Journey of Restoration. I'm really excited about this class. We started with the introduction, and then we hit it with brain basics. I hope you enjoyed the brain as much as I did. And now we're going to dive into CPR. We're starting with C, which means connection. And there'll actually be three classes in connection. We're going to start right now with connection with God, and then we're going to talk about connection with self, and then we're going to have connection with others. And these sessions are going to be absolutely critical. And as we jump into connection with God, when I say God, I mean the Godhead, and we're talking about God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And if you're following Christ, when you accepted Jesus you have a hundred percent of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You will never get more of him from his standpoint. And now we spend our lives then sharing space. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit and we share space with him, giving him more and more of our thoughts and our feelings and our choices, our behaviors, our actions. And it's a beautiful, beautiful process. Now, if you remember... In the very beginning, in the introduction, I ask you a really important question. And in all sincerity, I ask you, how are you? And, and I really care about you. But in reality, there's something bigger than ourselves. I think at times that the world revolves around me. And if we go back to the beginning, in the beginning, Lori. Wait a second. No, it doesn't say that. It was in the beginning, God. And actually, there's a question that's even more important than how are you? And that question is, who is Jesus? And if we would ask that to everybody in a packed room, we may have just as many answers about who Jesus is as there are people in the room. And it's really important nowadays that question of are you a Christian or do you go to church or who is Jesus? Sometimes we may not really get to the root of if someone really knows him and if somebody is really following him. Whether or not I go to church really has nothing to do with being a Christ follower at times. And I, I think about I've stood in my garage have you? Probably not in my garage, obviously, but have you stood in your garage? And when you stood in your garage, did that make you a car? And so just because we go to church or we've been to church, or even if we've said the sinner's prayer, or if we grew up in a Christian household, this is a question that we have to wrestle with that will have implications for our past, our present, and our future. And this question will actually matter even billions of years from now into eternity. And so church and religion and Christians may not necessarily be following Christ. And so in the middle of this study, in the middle of this class, I've told you that we're going to utilize biblical foundations. So what is the biblical foundation? And that's what we're going to adhere to. And so it's really, really important in our connection as we continue to build that you are connected with Jesus. And so instead of asking you if you're a Christian or asking you if you've gone to church or asking you how many minutes or or hours that you've spent reading the word or praying or any of those things, I'm going to ask you this question. What was the last thing that Jesus has done in your life? And I want to challenge you. If you don't have something today or even yesterday, there was a saying that if he hasn't spoken in the last hour or today or yesterday, if it's even yesterday, then we've already backslidden. So are you connected with him? Are you fully alive and fully available in him? Are you connected with the creator of the universe? And so I think about when do we come to know Christ? And, and when I came to know Christ, it was about the time where I was introduced to Santa Claus or the tooth fairy or the Easter bunny. 
And if we're introduced to Jesus and the concepts of Jesus, if we have a head knowledge of Jesus, but not a heart knowledge of Jesus, if we just know about him and haven't experienced him, if he doesn't input into my emotions and into my imagination, if my faith hasn't grown as I've gotten bigger, when I was a little girl, if I was taught that if I'm good, then he'll bring good things like Santa Claus, right? So if you're a good girl, he's going to make his list. He's going to check it twice. He's going to find out if I've been naughty or nice. I was really naughty sometimes and he still came, but that's the concept. That's the mentality that we have about Jesus. So, so who is Jesus? And if we're good, right, then bad things won't happen to us. If we're good, then we'll bypass all the hurt, the pain, the shame, the, the sorrow, the sickness, the abuse, the disease, right? No, he never promised that that would be the case, but he promised he would be with us always. And so if our connection with him hasn't grown, if our faith in him hasn't grown, if we haven't abided in him on an intellectual and an experiential knowledge, if we, if we haven't grown in that, then the problems of this world, as they get bigger, as it gets more more heavy and, and really more serious. If we don't grow with him, then we'll wonder what we'll, we may end up leading and being led to a faith crisis. Our faith in him cannot be dependent upon what our parents said or about what anybody said. We have to wrestle and grow and grapple with these things. And then if we haven't grown with him and our maturity in following him hasn't grown, if we don't know how to hear his voice and to do these things, then when we end up in a pit, not if, but when we end up in a pit, then we're going to then, okay, God, I'm going to cry out to you. Okay, God, if you're really there, then I'm going to follow you. And Jesus, if you're really who you say you are, then I will give you the rest of my life. But I need you to just show up right now, right like I want you to show up and do exactly what I need you to do now. And I wonder if he'd be sitting up there thinking, oh, Lori, you have no idea. I've already done everything that I needed to do. I've actually given my life for you. I've made a way. I've been with you always. And so what more could I possibly do? And you're not following me. And so I think about this build a bear concept that we take kids to the mall and we go into a store and they can pick out any stuffed animal that they want. And they actually can stuff their stuffed animal, and then they pick out the clothes and they pick out the personality and they pick out all of the accessories to go with whatever they've chosen and they build a bear. And when we're in a crisis and when we remember in the beginning, Lori, we think that the world revolves around us. And so in the middle of all of that, we decide that we're going to build a Jesus and this Jesus needs to show up now, even though I've never invited him before. And he needs to do exactly what I want when I want in the timing. And I'm really better at running the universe than he is, by the way, because I know. And if he doesn't show up, then, then he must not be real. Pretty scary, isn't it? We're meant to lay down our lives. We're meant to know him. We're meant to make him known. We are self-absorbed and full of pride and rebellion. And so the best thing that we can do in the beginning of all of this is connect with him. And if we don't want to, we're better off not knowing. You're better off just pushing stop on this and going and doing something else. Because he is not meant to show up when we want, how we want. Hard things will happen. Horror does happen. And he will be with us always. And he loves us. And he's already done everything that he needs to do. And now it's time for us to submit and to surrender and to get over ourselves and to retrain our brain from the damage that's been done through trauma and sin and our thought processes. It's time for us to die to ourselves. It's time for us to suck it up buttercup. And most people don't want to do what's required. But I can tell you, if you do, and when you do, that's what you were born for. That's what you were created for. That's the only thing that will satisfy. We have to connect with him. And so I want to tell you, we were overdoing work in Nepal. 
And when you're over in Nepal, we were working with human trafficking victims. And I decided naturally, we're over there, we have a free day. And what more could you possibly want to do besides throw yourself off of the Himalaya mountains? And so that's what we did. We were going to go paragliding. And so we climbed to the mountain top. We got out of our vehicle. We walked onto the mountain. And before I could even look around or start to think about it, this guy comes up to me. He's got a parachute attached to him. He straps me in. He doesn't even have time to introduce himself. He said, Lori, this is what I need you to do. I need you to walk, 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 run, 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 and then jump. And I just did it. And I walked, 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 ran, 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 and jumped. And before I even had time to think about and process what was going on, I was up in the clouds with my new pilot, who then I found out what his name was and saw the parachute and then started to think about, oh, no. What have I done and what are the connections? I started to look at the straps and I started to evaluate the carabiners and I was connected in. And so instead of being panicky about did we or didn't we, instead about worrying about how are we going to land, I had no idea how we were going to land. I finally decided to trust the connection and to sit back and relax and enjoy the ride. And so that's what I want to encourage you to do. Let's get connected, but then let's let the process happen. Let's do the hard work. Let's check our connections. Just yesterday, as I was preparing for this, I needed a little bit of stress relief and to go and to burn off some excess energy. And so we went to the indoor rock climbing gym and I strapped in and I checked my connection and I did about 10 runs up and down the wall and I had so much fun. And so, but it was critical that I checked my connection. And even as I went higher and higher before I ascended to the top of the walls, I loved along the walls, there were signs that said, are you clipped in? And so that's what I want to teach you is how do we check? How do we check if we're clipped in? How do we evaluate our connection with God? There's lots of different meanings with being connected with God or who Jesus is, but I want to put us all on a level playing field and build a really good firm foundation with connecting with the Godhead. And so again, back to the beginning, we talked about it starts with him. And so quite frankly, I want to tell me, and I want to tell you this, it is not all about you, your behavior and the things that you've done and the things that you've thought and the world spinning on its axis around you is really not true. And it doesn't even start with you. And so the enemy would love for us to be self-absorbed and self-consumed, whether we think too much of ourselves or we think too little of ourselves. I just don't have what it takes. I just can't do this. I just, this is terrible. Or I'm all that in a bag of chips. Either way, what's the common denominator? That common denominator is you. And that common denominator is me. But Guys, we're supposed to have something more than just us. That just gets nauseating at some point. And so in your material, I want to point you to who you are. I want to affirm that you are so amazing that he died for you and he died for me. And so who you are actually started with what happened to you. Because of what he did, it happened to you and he set you into place. He holds everything together. And because of him, then we start to find out we're meant to glorify him, to spend our life glorifying him. And then we find out what our purpose is and how we can specifically with our gift mixes and our talents and develop into who we are. But it starts with the foundation of him, not us. And then once we realize that, we realize that we're loved. He loves us because he loves us because he loves us. We can't do anything else to make him love us more. He won't love us more if we do what he's called us to do. He won't love us more if we don't sin. He won't love us more if you get through this curriculum. You can't earn the love. It's already been given to you even before you showed up on planet Earth. And that you're forgiven. 
And no matter what we've done, if we go to him and we turn and we go in the opposite direction and we repent, we're forgiven and we're created for something great. He could have taken care of this whole mess on planet earth, but he passed the baton to the apostles that passed the baton to the disciples that have been passing the baton until finally we represent 7% of the population that's ever lived on planet earth. And the ball is in our hands. We are on the field in present time, in this time. And we are called to advance the gospel of the kingdom. So you're created for greatness. You're created to do something that's amazing and that could impact the world billions of years from now. And then finally, everything that you need can be found in him. That's it, him, him and him alone. He provides everything. He made everything. And if you look to someone or something else, you're looking to creation and not the creator. And so in your packet, there are also the names of God. I would encourage you to get those names and to start to meditate on that and to start to really incorporate a head knowledge and a heart knowledge with what's going on with who he is. He is just that amazing. He doesn't have peace or doesn't have love. He is peace and he is love. And that's where we need to start in our connection with him. We need to get the connection right about who he is and what he's done and therefore who we are and that we're loved and forgiven with a purpose. And so I want to make reference to a Mike Bickle book. It's called The Seven Longings of the Human Heart. Really, really good. I would encourage you to read it. I'm, I'm going to read you just a few excerpts out of the book. I actually have the electronic copy on my Kindle. And so Mike really refers to there are seven longings that we have inside of us. And those longings can only be filled by Jesus. There is a longing in us to be enjoyed. There's a longing inside of us to be fascinated. We have a longing for beauty and to see beauty. We have a longing for greatness. We have a longing for intimacy without shame. We have a longing to be wholehearted. And then finally, there's a longing inside every one of us that Jesus placed inside of us to make a deep and a lasting impact. Now, let me read you just a few excerpts from the book. And then I would highly encourage you at some point in your life to put this on your reading list. Really, really good. So what is a longing? And so according to Mike, it's an ache of the heart. There's a cavity of our spirit spirit that's crying to be filled. It can't be reasoned with. It can't be negated or dismissed. If we don't attend to it, purposefully attend to it, then it will overta it'll overtake us. And so one way or another, legitimately or illegitimately, a human longing must and will be fulfilled. They were placed in us by God and only can be fulfilled by God. They're designed to entice us into his grace and into his presence. But again, back to the build a bear, most of us turn to God or to Jesus as a last resort. And then in our desperation, we don't even know how to connect with him because now we have a skewed perception. We do all we can to fulfill the longings of our heart with entertainment, possessions or relationships. And if we're a big, hot, dysfunctional mess, guess who we're going to attract? Other big, hot, dysfunctional messes. And so now we have broken people that are in our lives and we only find that these things create a greater void. And so in time, the scaffolding that we have built to keep our souls propped up falls apart. Yet God appears in our emptiness. Again, it's not about what we do or don't do. It's about him and what he's done. He's constantly pursuing us. And so at first, our cold hearts, they can't even respond. But as a fire of his love softens and warms our hearts, a miracle takes place. Life appears. A heartbeat is heard. It's perhaps faint at first but growing in strength and purpose. And so over time, 
in this process, I love his language, over time, you and me will find ourselves standing before him more fascinated with pure love and truth than we ever were with false fulfillment. And so I want to ask you what we started with. So who is Jesus? And if you know him, if you've encountered him, things should change. When I came to know him, I just eventually went back to business as usual. And I went through my early years and adolescence and into adulthood. But when I had that near death encounter and I was staring at Jesus face to face, looking into his eyes that day on September 17th in 2005, from that day forward, every day has been radically different. And I change day by day and I connect with him every day. And I'm not the same. I'm growing and I hear from him and I experience him and I'm in awe of him. And whether things are good or whether things are bad or whether I miss the mark or whether I knock it out of the park, I'm falling more and more in love with him, but I do things to foster that. And so I want to ask you again, this question, where do you feel the closest to him? And wherever that is, you need to integrate that into your schedule and make sure you have time to connect with him. Some people like to get up in the morning and they spend an hour or two, or they read the word or they do worship or they like quiet strolls or I'm way too hyper for any of that. I encountered him on the rock wall. And I encounter him in sports and doing extreme things. And I encounter him in the word. But when I'm in the word, I'm on the Stairmaster or I'm on the treadmill and I'm going at double speed or if I can, triple speed. And, and I'm exercising and I'm listening to the word and I'm, I'm in thinking about those things. And so when I wake up in the morning, I think about him. And throughout the day, I think about him. And, and at night, I think about him. He's the last thing I think about before I go to bed. And I dream about him and what he and I are doing together, but I foster that connection. And so I want to encourage you. We can't compare. I don't wish that I had a different personality or I don't envy somebody who connects in a different way. I bless God for the way that they connect. And I I encourage them and press them to do that and to move towards God. My husband experiences Jesus in a different way. But for me, if I start to get a little funky, my husband knows the key word is I'm not as connected to God as I need to be. I've got too much energy. I'm whirling. And his, his then cue to me is, are you exercising? Which he knows that if I'm exercising and if I'm doing extreme sports or the things that I like to do that connects me with him, where I meditate and where I can, and listen to the podcast and listen to the words, then I'm connected to him and close to him. And so you need to incorporate that into your every day. And so what I want to do is I want to give you a little bit of a practical application about what you need to start doing today. I want to encourage you in every transition throughout the day for the next week. So this morning I got up and I went from my bedroom into the living room. And so that's a transition. And then from the living room into the kitchen. And then from the kitchen back into my bedroom. And from my bedroom into my car, and from my car into this location, I want to encourage you in every environment that you go into, in every transition, as you walk across a new threshold, I want you to ask the question, where is Jesus? And whether you get anything or not, I just want you to start to order your brain to be acutely aware of asking that question. It's not about the outcome. It's not about the destination. It's not about what we get or don't get. It's about actively being in the here and the now and increasing our awareness of him. That's where I want you to start. And if he does show you something or does reveal something to you, then I want you to play follow the leader. This is so much fun. And so if I wasn't a therapist and if I didn't do work to advance the gospel of the kingdom, then I would love to be a leisure specialist. And so everything is like a game to me. And so I think about that game, Where's Waldo? Now, to be really honest, I've never found Waldo. I don't have that kind of attention span, but I like to play Where's Jesus? So again, in every transition, where's Jesus? And when you find him, when he gives you an inclination, I want you to start to pursue that inclination. And if it's something that you can do, I want you to do it. We were at a restaurant the other night and I played that game and we sat down at the restaurant 
And then I felt like he started showing me things about the waitress. And personally, I love to carry $100 bills in my wallet. And he just continued to speak about this waitress. And I just saw that she's shifting the atmosphere, that she's carrying joy, that she's struggling. But he sees her and he knows her and he loves her. And she's carrying joy and she's pressing through and she's in a transition in her life. And so at the very end, I paid the bill and then I took a hundred dollar bill out of my wallet and I folded it up and I handed it to her. And she walked around the table, clearing the rest of the plates. And then she must have looked and seen it. And she came back around and she said, oh, I had no idea. Thank you. And I said, I feel like you need to know that you carry joy and that you're seen. And God bless you. We told her what we do and the work that we do. And she knew that we were following Christ. We were followers of Christ. And she literally got tears in her eyes and almost burst into tears and walked off. And so what would it look like if you just follow him and we're not going to cause harm and you start to do something outside of you? It's a beautiful thing that can start to happen. And so now, I don't know how long I've been talking, but I just can't stand to not talk just for a second about the brain. So I told you that we had to have brain basics because it would be incorporated into all of the curriculum that we were using. So let's review for a second. Here we have our brain, but I'm going to use my hand just for time's sake. So the lower part of our brain is meant for survival. The middle part of our brain is meant for our imagination and our emotions. And the, the top part of our brain is meant for intellect. And when we say we have a head knowledge of, well, the devil has a head knowledge of, the devil knows the scriptures, but he is not following Christ. And so we could have a head knowledge of, but it can mean nothing. It hasn't impacted our heart. But when we say heart, we're talking about the middle part of our brain. And so we were just in a country, a different country, and we were doing this curriculum. And there they'd been taught that it wasn't good to utilize your imagination with the scriptures and And you really didn't need to spend a lot of time imagining. And I think it's really important to note now with our brain that we are created for story. We love a good story. And again, there's a hero and a character who has a problem and needs a guide and can become a hero. We love hero stories. We love movies. Your brain, whether you like it or not, is spending about 30% of your time daydreaming. And one thing leads to another thing leads to another thing. And so instead of trying to fight that, that's how God created our brain. Why don't we go with that and use that for the glory of him? And so let me read you out of the Passion Translation. Ephesians 1 18. And I want to show you some other activities that you can do. I need you to start preparing the soil. Do you remember the, the story about the seeds that were planted? And if there's not good soil, then the seeds are taken away or they wither out or they die. And so I want to teach you how to prepare the soil in your brain, in your heart, but we know that that's your imagination and your emotions so that you can not only have a head knowledge of the scripture, but a heart knowledge. But I love Ephesians 1.18. I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation that will give us a foundation for this. So remember, we're doing the biblical foundations coupled with the neuroscience to change your brain and change your world forever. Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, flooding you with light until you experience a full revelation of the hope of his calling. That is the wealth of God's glorious inheritances that he finds us in, his holy ones. And so, again, what did it say? That the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination flooding you with light until you experience, experience. And so that's what I want to encourage you to do. So if we think about the Bible and from the beginning, in the beginning, what keeps us away from God? And when we feel shame, when we feel sin, what do we do? What did Adam and Eve do? What was the first thing that they did when they didn't do what they were supposed to do? They went and they hid. And so I want to go to John 21. I want to read to you out of the Message Bible. And I want you to start to do this activity, this exercise with the middle part of your brain. I want to teach you how to do some things in the middle of this course so that you will open the eyes of your heart and that you will experience him in a deep way that you need to experience him. And so this is one of my favorite passages. And so let me set it up just for a second. So 
it's not looking good for the home team, the disciples. Oh my goodness. They went from the, the Passover. Jesus said, Hey guys, I'm going to be killed. And they're like, Oh no, you're not. You're going to set up. You're going to over overthrow the Roman government. You're going to set up. And then they were fighting about who's going to be on his right side and his left side. And he said, no, you have no idea what I'm getting ready to do. And in fact, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And what did Peter say? Nope, not me, not going to do it. And so here we find ourselves that sure enough, Jesus was taken in. He was questioned. He was tried. He was crucified. He was buried. There's a great deal of persecution. There's all kinds of uproar. And what do the disciples do? And sure enough, Peter denies Jesus three times. And so here's Peter showing up on the this, this scene with the disciples. And here's what he said. Hey guys, I'm going fishing. And the rest of them said, okay, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got in the boat and they caught nothing that night. Man, this is going from bad to ugly. They, de they de denied Christ. They didn't listen to him. It looks like it's over. And quite frankly, if the son of God who became the son of man, who predicted his death, burial and resurrection didn't resurrect, then it would have been game over. He would have been like every other thing or every other religion. And, but that's not what happened. And so they caught nothing that night. When the sun came up, Jesus was standing on the beach, but he didn't reckon, they didn't recognize him. And so Jesus said to them, good morning. Did you catch anything for breakfast? And they said, nope. So he said, okay, then throw your nets off to the right side of the boat and see what happens. They did what he said. And all of a the sudden there were so many fish in it. They weren't strong enough to pull it in. So the disciples failed miserably. They go back out to their day job, which they should be fishing for men and not fishing for fish. They didn't catch squat. Jesus shows up on the scene. They didn't even recognize him. He didn't say, man, you guys stink. What are you doing? He said, hey guys, throw your, throw your nets onto the other side. And he didn't just give them a fish or two. They filled their nets. And then John said to Peter, it's the master. And when Peter realized that it was him, he threw on some clothes for he was stripped for work. He dove into the sea. The other disciples came in by boat for they weren't far from land, a hundred yards or so pulling along the net full of fish. And when they got out of the boat, they saw a fire laid with fish and bread cooking on it. Are you kidding? He's gonna now give them breakfast? The disciples that thought it was game over, Peter who denied him. And then Jesus said, bring of the fish that you, some of the fish over that you've just caught. And so Simon and Peter joined him and pulled the net to shore. 153 big fish. And even with all of the fish, the net didn't rip. So it wasn't some half, half net full of fish. It was packed full to the point, but the net didn't even Rip. And so Jesus said, breakfast is ready. So not one of the disciples dared ask, who, who are you? They knew, they knew it was the master. Jesus then took the bread and he gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had shown himself alive to the disciples since being raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, hey buddy, come here, come here. And now this is beautiful. This is how he's gonna restore Peter, he said, do you love me more than these? And Peter's like, master, you know, I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. And then he asked him again, do you love me? And he said, master, you know, I love you. He said, shepherd my sheep. And then he said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was upset that he asked him for the third time, do you love me? So he answered, master, you know, everything there is to know. You've got to know that I love you. Peter denied him three times. He knew, Jesus knew right there where Peter was, that he wouldn't give his life for Jesus. But Jesus still said, in the middle of that, you've gone back out to your day job. My paraphrasing, you've dragged all the other disciples with you. And now I'm going to feed you breakfast. And I, here's what I want you to do. I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to shepherd my sheep. And then finally, he said, feed my sheep. 
I'm telling you the very truth now. When you were young, you dressed yourself and you went wherever you wished. But when you get old, you'll have to stretch out your hands while someone else dresses you and takes you where you don't want to go. He said this to hint at the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he commanded, follow me. So when we mess up, when we don't do what's needed, he fills our nets. He brings us in close. He, he feeds us breakfast and then he knows where we're at and he wants us to acknowledge where we're at. Peter's like, I don't have agape love for you. I won't give my life for you. And he said this anyway. He said, then feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep. And then Jesus prophesied to Peter what would eventually happen, that Jesus would get, have an undying or Peter would have an undying love for Jesus and he would give up his life. And in fact, Peter would be martyred. He would be crucified upside down. So what does that look like? That's the head knowledge, but how does that feel? So I want you to imagine that you're there. So they're out on the boat. What does a boat look like? What does it smell like? They see somebody and they say, cast your nets to the right. When they get 153 fish and they realize it's Jesus. What about when Jesus is talking to Peter? So find yourself in that scenario. Close your eyes and activate the imagination screen in your mind. Let Jesus illuminate it. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to show us. So what does that look like? What do you see? What do you smell? What do you taste? What do you feel? What would it felt, have felt like on our skin? What would we hear? What does it feel like inside of you? Jesus fed him. Jesus pulled him in close. Jesus didn't say, you guys stink, or I can't believe you've done this, or just get away from me, or ha ha, I've risen from the dead, but now you've blown it. He pulls them in, and he tells them what to do, and he loves them. And so think about now, let's make it practical. We've got to make the, the scriptures practical. Again, we're doing exercises in our middle brain to connect us with him. It's critical. So I want you to think about a time in your life where you were in sin or you were in pain or you're in doubt, or maybe now. And imagine yourself in front of Jesus. So where's your spot with him? Are you on a beach? Are you in a chair? Are you in nature? Are you climbing a rock wall or jumping off of a mountain? And so in light of John 21, what would he say to you? Jesus, where are you? What do you want to do with me? What do you want to say to me? And you've got to activate your senses. What do you see? What do you smell? What do you taste? What does it feel like on your skin? What do you hear? What does it feel like on the inside of you? And then let's ask him. So Jesus, how much do you love me? What do you want to celebrate with me? What are your instructions for me? How can you feed me? Where are you in my pain and my struggles? This, guys, is critical. And so I want to encourage you, even if you need to do this later, this is an activity you've got to do. Because a lot of times we won't get real with Jesus. We won't just go to him. We think we have to run and we have to hide. And he's calling us. He wants to feed us. He wants to give us instructions and he wants to show us what we're going to become. But we put on these masks. So let me read you a quote from the book, The Cure. The author goes on to say, no one told me that when I wear a mask, only my mask receives love. We can gain admiration and respect from behind a mask. We can even intimidate. But as long as we're behind a mask, any mask, we will not be able to receive love. Then in our desperation to be loved, we'll rush to fashion more masks, hoping the next will give us what we're longing for, to be known, accepted, trusted, and loved. And so let's take off our masks. Let's get real with Jesus. Let's activate all of our brain to be connected with him. And let's know that shame will push us away just like it did with Adam and Eve in the garden. That shame says to us, I'm not enough. Shame says that there's something wrong with me. That shame says that we are bad and we don't matter and we don't have what it takes in this moment or in this circumstance. 
And that's just not the truth. From a kingdom perspective, from a biblical perspective, all that we need is him. And we need to connect with him and then sit back and relax and enjoy the ride. But we need to make sure that we intentionally connect with him as if our life depends on it. Shame prepares us for the world, but love prepares us for the kingdom. And so there's nothing more pleasurable or powerful than when God reveals God to the human spirit. That's what you're created for. That's what you're meant for. And so I want to do one other activity with you as we're, again, we're activating the middle part of our brain. And so I want you to get into a comfortable position. And if you want, then close your eyes. I want to read you a story about a good room. And I want you to just activate your imagination. So see, again, on the, on the imagination screen, in your mind, if you can get a picture about a good room. So what is a good room? I don't know. Did you ever go to your grandmother's house or in your mom's house or in your house? There's a room that looks better than every other room. And typically nobody can go into that room. There's not dog pee on the, on the rug. There's maybe China in the China cabinet. Nobody hangs out in that room, but it does, it's not the catch all room. And maybe that room is in the front of the house. And when people walk by or when people first come in, they're allowed to go into that room, but no other room. That's the good room. And so I want you to imagine yourself now as a house. And so again, here's where we're going to activate your imagination, the middle part of your brain. And so you're a house, but outside of you, outside of your house is Jesus. And Jesus wants to come in. And you want to invite him in. But then you really don't want him to come in because you're okay with what's going on now. Or when something happens, you go crack the door and ask him for something. Kind of like the build a bear. Or you won't let him in because your house is a mess and you think you need to clean it up first. There are bad relationships. You know, you're doing some stuff that you shouldn't be doing. You're full of yourself and full of pride. You're never enough. Something bad's always going to happen to you. I mean, we could go on and on. And we think the only one who can clean it is us. But in reality, the only one who needs to partner with us so that we can clean our house is standing outside. Or maybe we just, again, let Jesus come into that one room, the good room. It's usually, again, the biggest room with the window that everybody can see in. Everybody sees it and thinks that the entire house is clean and that we're okay. But here's what I want to tell you. If you will let Jesus in throughout this course, make the decision to let him into the entire house, and then he will show up with the contractor, the Holy Spirit, and together you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit with God the Father can make the entire house clean. How would that feel if you could allow him to come in And you could quit protecting yourself. And so I want you to really reflect on this. Does he have access to everything? He already knows everything. Have you been driven away from him in shame? Or shame, are you so wrapped up with how you think he needs to show up with the results and you're building your own Jesus? And or have you let him into your entire house? And so ultimately, Jesus is the only one who can meet our needs. I want to make reference to another book that I think is really good. It's called Questions for Jesus. And and the premise of this is, is that we're all, again, kind of like the Mike Bickle book, that we're all created for connection. We're meant to be connected. We all need stability. We all need competence and we need achievement. But if we try to find our connection, our stability, our competence, or our achievement into anything else besides Jesus or anyone else besides Jesus, then we will fall short. That we first let have, have to let him be our connection. He needs to be our stability. He needs to be our competence, and he needs to be our achievement. 
And so what I would encourage you in the next slide with the questions for Jesus is the next time you get dysregulated or you get bunged up or you're mad or you're frustrated or something's happening, then I want you to take a look and ask Jesus and the Holy Spirit to show you what it is that you need. And you're trying to get that need met in someone or something else. You have holes inside of you. And the only one that can fulfill those holes is Jesus. And so if you're trying to fill those things with something else, or if someone's trying to get you to be what fulfills the holes inside of them, it will never, ever go well. If you need two and somebody gives you two, then it still won't be enough. And then if they give you four, it still won't be enough. You have to go to Jesus, find what you need in all of these areas, let him totally fill you. And then that's what you'll be able to offer back to the world. Again, another really good resource. And so now as we're winding this down, there's a lot of choices. And I want to just give you a definition right now for sin. Sin is the attachment to the wrong thing, a lesser thing. And then I want to read James 4 out of the message. And I want you to just listen to this. Nothing else will do but Jesus. But ultimately the choice is ours. And so starting in James 4, 4, it says you're cheating on God. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God and his way. And do you suppose that God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he is a fiercely jealous lover and what he gives in love is far better than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud but God gives grace to the willful humble. So let God work his will in your life. Yell aloud no to the devil and watch him make himself scarce. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin, purify your inner life, quit playing the field, hit bottom and cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over, get serious really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. And so this may sound really, really difficult, but it's not. This is what you were born for. This is what I was born for. This is more natural than not. Sin is a substitution. Sin is lesser. And so I believe we can do this. I believe in the impossible because I know the invisible. And if we'll connect to him, if we'll activate our brains, if we'll do the work in our soil, if we'll look for him in every environment that we go into and follow him. We'll make mistakes and bad things will still happen. And, and it's not a build of Jesus and what we want Jesus to look like, but he's a real thing and he's better than what we could even imagine. And if you've been through trauma and hurt and heartache and pain and the horror and you're wondering, could this really happen? You know, as a trauma therapist, people come to me all the time and they say, Lori, are you an expert in this? And I'll say, yes. But Lori, have you ever experienced this? And I'll say, no. And even if people have been through similarly what you've been through, nobody knows exactly. And in order for you to heal, somebody has to bear witness. Somebody has to know exactly. And the cross is the greatest trauma. Healing begins when someone bears witness Jesus experienced every single injustice, the cross being the greatest trauma. And Jesus went before us on that cross and was raised up. So I want to end this session and I want to read you an excerpt from the book Suffering and the Heart of God by Diane Langberg. And again, I have it on my Kindle she said, the crucified is the one most traumatized. He has borne the World Trade Center. He has carried the Iraq War, the destruction in Syria, the Rwandan massacres, the AIDS crisis, the poverty in our inner cities, and the abused and trafficked children. He was wounded for the sins of those who perpetrated such horrors. He has carried the griefs and the sorrows of the multitudes who have suffered the natural disasters of this world. 
the earthquakes, the cyclones, and the tsunamis. He has borne our selfishness, our complacency, our love of success, and our pride. He has been in the darkness. He has known the loss of all things. He has been abandoned by his father. He has been to hell. There is no part of any tragedy that he has not known and carried. He has done this so that none of us need face tragedy alone because he has been there before us and will go with us. That, my friends, is who he is. And I want to encourage you then to do this transition challenge. And in every transition throughout your day, I want you to find Jesus and I want you to activate the middle part of your brain. And I want you to start to imagine with him. And I want you to start to develop a true faith in him that comes from abiding in him, knowing that that doesn't mean everything will end well and that everything will go along and we will have Mr. Bluebird on our shoulders singing zippity doo dot that it will be really, really hard at times, that we will end up in pits, that we will suffer and those that we care about will suffer. But in the end, Jesus is enough. I'll see you next time.